Hi, I'm Mike Bird, and in this theological conversation, I'm talking to Dr. Christy Thornton from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary about theological method. Uh, we cover some good terrain. We look at the subjects of uh, the role of the Bible in theology. We talk about different types of theological method from liberation theology, liberal theology. Uh, we also talk about one of her favorite pet topics, which is Thomas Torrance, who's a Scottish theologian. And it's a pretty wide ranging discussion. But if you're beginning theology, if you're new to theology, I know you'll definitely, definitely benefit what, from what Dr. Thornton says. She's got such great wisdom to share, and she's a very accomplished theologian in her own right. So check out what we have to say and what we cover. It'll be a great chat to listen to and certainly something you'll want to share with students if you're involved in theological education. So enjoy the interview. Well, hello everyone. I am joined by a friend of mine, Dr. Christy Thornton, who is the Associate Director of PhD and MTH Studies at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest in North Carolina. Uh, go Blue Devils. Um, sure. Well, actually, I don't really, I don't know. I can't say Tar Heels. I can't follow a team who's named on something you stepped in. Um, otherwise, you could you could get something like you know Lego in my foot, or kind of mud between my toes. <laughs> I can't follow a Oops. team that's based on stuff you step in. I just that's yeah. true. Though I would I would cheer for the the Lego foots because Lego there's foots. real pain involved there. Like we all oh understand. so much pain, so much pain. Although I'm pretty big on mud between my toes. Mud if you're lucky, uh, that... to be honest. <laughs> yeah, but there we go. But anyway, I'm here with Dr. Uh, Christy Thornton, who is a uh, theologian in her own right, did a PhD on Thomas Torrance, and we're going to talk about theological method. So uh, first up, uh, Christy, if I can be so presumptuous and, and personal with Please, you. Please, uh, by all means. Christy, uh, what would, what, I mean, when you think of theological method, what comes to your mind? Yeah, so um, the term is difficult to define, and some because in our heads, when you say method, we're like, all right, so give me a step-by-step -step plan to get this thing done, you know, like the method for building an IKEA desk. You do this, and then you do that, and then you do this, and then you do that. And, and so when I do it, it still looks like a barbecue at the end, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, last summer I built lots of Ikea furniture and somehow I think that's still imprinted on me. Uh, so sometimes when we say theological method, we really want this like step-by-step -step manual, but I'm not sure that's really the best way for us to think about a theological method, um, that it's not necessarily play-by-play. -play. So the way that I think about it is the method then becomes the how-to, like how do we do theology which means that in order for us to answer that how to do theology we have to think really well about what theology is first and then as we define what we mean by theology it will help designate for us the right how to to go about whatever this thing is that's theology so then well how would you define theology if you're like just pushing it a yeah. step back yeah. So sometimes, um, so I, when I teach this in my class, I make my students define it and be like, well, what, when you, when I say theology, what do you think? And the number one answer is, Mike, do you know the number one answer? The study of God. Survey says the study of God. So like almost everyone, they're like, oh, it's theo and ology. We put those together. That means the study of God. Um, and my answer to that is always like sort of, right? So like sort of. Um, but even the terms at that point, the, if we take them back, we're taught that ology means study of, but there's something logos -y about this term, even ology, that there's a, there's a rationality associated with this. So when we start talking about this rationality of God, oh man, suddenly I'm like, oh, this is really different than, than talking about any other type of rationality. Because God is entirely different than anything else in creation. So in, in that sense, then, for me, theology is um, primarily oriented to our knowledge of God. And because there's no one like God, our, the method through which we know him has to be essentially distinct 
from the method that we use to know other objects of knowledge. So like to give it in a, a kind of concrete form, like uh, the method that I use to know a desk would be that I would like touch it and like look at it. And like there may be an instruction manual that tells me about it. If I know what different wood smell like, I might smell it. You could maybe taste it, but that would be weird. And so I use this like method to know a desk because of what a desk is. But if I want to get to know another person, I'm not going to use the same method, right? So I don't like touch and like smell other people to get to know them. That's not a method appropriate to the object of a person. To get to know a person, you need to talk to them and listen to them and observe them and kind of do all those things. So if we take that same concept, then when we start talking about God, well, he's neither a desk nor another human person. So there has to be a method then that's appropriate to knowledge of a God who is God. So he's ontologically distinct for us, holy, uh, and a God who is triune, a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so if I can break down what you're saying, Christy. You're saying that when we're doing theology, the study of God, we could say that this is the the rational ordering of our knowledge of God, but the the the, the subject of study, or I should say, the uh, yeah, the the the, uh, the the person we're studying, it's different from studying a desk or a, or a person. It's not like an empirical study in the world. It's based on the knowledge of God. Uh, does that mean that um, very very important to theology and the the beginning stages of theology would be something like a doctrine of revelation? Yeah, I mean, certainly um, the, and that's the like, well, how do we go about knowing this God? Well, we know this God because he has revealed himself as the next step in the conversation. So, uh, because this God who's holy and separate has, has himself come to us, that, that he came to us so that we might know him. And he came to us when he became a human um, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that our knowledge of God then is centered in the, the life of the son and empowered by the spirit. And at that point, so like when I start walking through this with Christians who are disciples of the church, um, they, they really love God and believe this. When we start getting to that point, they're like, oh, so like this knowledge of God then comes through this gospel that I like already believe. Like, oh, I'm a big fan of the gospel. And then the gospel becomes this kind of macro category that our knowledge of God comes from, that we actually know this God through his revelation in the gospel. And then the orienting for all the things that we say about him come from this revelation in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then according to the written text of scripture. So we know that gospel in the text. Yeah, well, anyone who knows my work knows I'm very big on sort of, you know, beginning with the gospel as the sort of foundation right. of our knowledge of God. Um, a little bit I, funny to do this with you, Mike, I'll say. Uh, yes. I'm just like thinking about the way you even organize your systematic theology is in this way. We're, we're doing something very similar oh, uh, in that. That's terrific. That's terrific. But yeah, I mean, we, we've got to attain. The, it's the method for attaining the knowledge of God, which God himself has revealed, and I guess yeah. organizing it. And um, I like to think the, also the aim is to show not just what, the, what knowledge God has revealed, showing what the doctrines are, uh, but showing the connection between them, you know, how does my view of Christ impact my view of the church? And then knowing what the practical implications, how does that all work out in practice? A good theological method, I think, is going to do that, allow us to see connections and drive us towards some kind of application. Yeah, so I think I do something that's uh, uh, similar, but maybe a little bit different. It's just maybe helpful conversation for us to, to have together. So then the next, so the next question that kind of I think about in this kind of trajectory of like knowing God uh, through His revelation in the Son, this gospel, um, then then becomes well, what are the words that we say? So this is kind of so, some of the doctrine piece here. The well, the words that we say then to describe this God uh, to one another about this God. How do we understand those in the category? So when I start thinking about words that Christians use in terms um, of like theological language, I'm, I put the focus on that our theological language is purposefully communicative. So it's not just that Christians are saying true things because they're true things, but the, there's a purpose of Christian theology that is a communication 
of this gospel, both within the church and an invitation for others into this. So that doctrines even become a way for us to clarify our knowledge of the gospel that we know and proclaim. And in that way, I, um, I th- there are a few things I'm like trying to do and I do that. But part of it is that um, part of our, our words are essentially missional. There's something about theology that's essentially a missional activity as we proclaim this gospel. So when I give my like definition, definition of theology, then I, I would say that it's a retelling of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the written text of scripture in the communion of the church. Uh, is what theology is really doing is how to learning how to give this culturally appropriate retelling um, in my context for how to retell this gospel. And then doctrines give us a way to understand this gospel um, through different kind of lenses into this one reality of what God has done in Christ. Okay, well, that's a good, a very good way of putting it. Doctrine as a kind of um, aid memoir to help us understand the, the gospel better yeah. and then to get on with the business of telling the gospel. Okay. Um, that's good, and I think we're singing off the same sheet of gospel music here, um, Christy. Mm-hmm. But there are different theological methods out there. Um, there are different ways of doing. There are different ways of skinning um, a cat or a fish, or I don't know, maybe a possum. Uh, depends what part of the world you're in. Uh, what are some of the different theological methods that you know of, or, or that you see as being prominent in your part of the world? Yeah. So I mean, I think the most um, maybe famous and common. Cause again, like the method is related to what we say theology is. So I think probably the most common way to think about what theology is in my, my neck of the woods is some version of what the Bible says about any given topic. Right. So like we think of a topic and then we go to the Bible and we collect all of the relevant Bible verses. And then we assemble those into some type of summary. And then that, and then I give this statement of a doctrine And then hopefully I can find a way to take this statement of a doctrine and relate it to my life. Uh, And then that becomes maybe the most kind of common theological method um, that, that I can think of uh, in, in my, in my realm. But that's not exactly what I just described. Yeah, Uh, I agree. I mean, I, I would say that's kind of like the beginning phase of theology. That's kind of like the kind of like assembling the ingredients uh, but you've you've got to you've got to find there's got to be some other steps as well. I mean, you've also got to think, you know, how have these biblical texts been understood in light of the wider tradition? You know, so you you know you want to map you know the significance of a given text. You know, like Revelation five. You know, what impact did that have on the development of Nicene doctrine? Um, you know, there there are oh, things yeah. like things like that I think you might want to consider. Sometimes I think we've got to talk about nature as well. You know, if you're looking at the doctrine of humanity, you know, human beings, you know, it may be interesting to kind of point out a few basic facts from biology, uh, those kind of things. And, you know, and then you've also, I also, the older I get, the more I think we've got to realize um, how culturally situated we can be ourselves. Sure. And, um, you know how we're all products of our own um, environment. You know what? You know, you know what? What? What are things that I believe because I'm Australian, and what things do I believe because I'm a Christian? So you know, and sometimes sure. you try to pass off one as the other, which which can be which can be very uh, difficult. But yeah, so you got the, the biblical method. We don't we don't know anything about that in America, Mike. That's <laughs> just an Australian. Football. It only happens to other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being 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 a product of your cultural environment that only happens to other people. Never happens. Right. Ne- Just never happens to Australians. No, only ha- only happens to us Aussies. No one else. Yeah, but uh, okay. Well, that's that's one method which has got yeah, something right but- because it's the Bible is treated seriously and is the main ingredient. But I think it's deficient on its own. So you're about to add something. Yeah, and I think there are a couple of other pieces that like are going to add some of my the questions that I ask about that method. One is that I think it starts, um, it presumes a starting place that's earlier, but it's not articulate. So like, maybe it would be possible for someone who's not a Christian to accomplish this task. Like someone who's not a Christian could do this just really academic exercise of walking up to the Bible and then reassembling these things and whatever. But, but perhaps we should be more intentional on the front end of this too, that before we're doing this work of doctrine that's related to the gospel, man, you really have to confess this gospel. Like you really have to be born again in Christ to do this discipline because the heartbeat of what we're doing is knowing God. 
and in order to know God, like if you take John 17, three, that like that this is eternal life, that you know God, Jesus Christ, and he sent, then that knowledge of God is a salvation category. So that before we're even going about this Christian work of articulating doctrine in order to, to help equip us to retell and proclaim this gospel, we get to actually be a Christian to read the Bible this way. Uh, and so may, maybe starting there is, is one, one piece that I'd like to add and make sure that whatever we're doing is essentially Christian in ourselves and has, is somehow connected to the life of the church. So there's something of our experience in the ministry of the church, the gospel that was proclaimed to us by the church that we believe according yeah. to this text, like, most most people are coming to faith through the through the proclamation of the church. Uh, some people are like read it on their own, but most people are coming through the proclamation of the church. And then our our growing up in this church and discipleship and this ministry of the word that's happening week in and week out, and the observance of baptism and the Lord's Supper and other discipleship things. Like, well, that that's that's got to be involved in some way in this work that we're doing in our thinking, so that those are essentially connected. So that we don't have a Christian thing that's not churchly in some sense. So I think that's one piece that's missing is there's there's this integration on the front end with the life of the church and the actual belief of the Christian who's doing this. And then the other, like the question is, so like when you get to this step, and you alluded to some of this in the historical work that you do, that, that one way to solve this problem is historical, but of, well, I how do you pick relevant Bible verses? What makes a Bible, a Bible verse relevant and not? And what's the unifying thing about the text of scripture that dictates how we interpret it? So it doesn't, this type of um, theology doesn't come with it, a requirement of any type of interpretive structure involved in the text, which puts us in a, in a weird category because then the interpreter, the interpreter becomes that structure. So whoever is making the decisions about what are the relevant Bible verses and what their summary is, there's something that all of that's kind of living in the mind of the person who's doing it. And I'm not sure that that's the safest way to interpret the text, especially when we didn't begin with our confession of the gospel and our life in the church. Yeah. Then suddenly this can become something that goes awry very quickly. That's very biblical, but not necessarily Christian. Yeah. Uh, Not that that always happens, but it can happen. I think that's exactly right, because even with the assembling of the Bible verses, um, you, you, you're making interpretive decisions, and the way you sum them up, you're making interpretive. And people want to say, look, I'm just showing what is in the Bible, but there's a whole bunch of presuppositions, there's a whole bunch of pre-understanding that is already operating, and some people can be very... Um, uh, naive and saying, but there is no pre-understanding. I'm just, I'm just kind of laying out the ingredients on the plate, uh, despite the fact that some of the ingredients have been pre-packaged and some have been approved by the FDA and some have not been approved by the FDA or, or stuff like that. So yeah, I think that's a, a prominent method. Um, what yeah, and not, not to over, sorry, I could talk about this all day, but we'll just do one more lower piece. Uh, and, um, yeah, two pieces. One, when you didn't begin with the gospel, when you begin with the gospel, then you have something that's designated interpretation. That something then becomes the gospel that we've confessed that came from the scripture that we turn the scripture with. And then the other is like that process of pulling out Bible verses and putting them together. Not everyone who does this and most people who do it don't, but there's something that like some of the classic Christian heretics did this, like some of, some of the heretics yeah. The classic heresies, like that's what they did. That they were very biblical. Arianism is very biblical. Yeah. Arius is reading the text and making the argument for his heresy from the text of the scripture, but it's not Christian. And so some of it's like we have to reorient our minds to be like, just because you cited a Bible verse doesn't make it Christian because the classic heretics were very biblical and not Christian. Yep, I think that's that's a good thing. So we need the gospel of our pre-understanding and uh, for, for the interpretive task because the gospel is according to scripture, so we read scripture according to the gospel. Right, right. A great, a great man with two thumbs said that. Um, <laughs> and uh, the other thing No one is, ever said anything like that before. You were, you were the first to come up with that idea. On so many levels. <laughs> I was Well, I was the first one to make a, um, a Vegemite Sunday and possibly the last. Um, 
But um, oh, yeah, right. and also I like the point that uh, not just the gospel of pre-understanding, but you know, all all even deviant theological um, groups can have tried to secure their view in scripture, and uh, and, and that's why right. that's why Irenaeus uh, to go my church history. That's why Irenaeus attacks the Valentinians. He says, yeah, that they love scripture, but they don't do it in light of the rule of faith. They're not interpreting in light of the storyline of scripture. They've got this really um, this somewhat weird. Um, cosmology and anthropology that is really driving the bits that they're using of scripture and how they're packaging it together. Yeah. And I mean, we're talking all around, I was talking all around Irenaeus earlier, but in, in that same area, he starts talking about how the scripture is the way he describes it's really helpful that it's this portrait of a King, but you can shatter that picture and reorganize its pieces to be a picture of a dog. Mm. But we have to read this where all the pieces are there, that's like where you reassemble the Bible verses to be something that's not its portrait. You can do that with the Bible, but you haven't read it rightly until you've beheld the portrait of the king uh, in it. And I, and I thought that Irenaeus, that, that analogy was always helpful for me in thinking about mm. what, what a ruled reading is and what it isn't. Yeah, that's, that's very good. That's a very good point. Uh, well, let's move on. We've looked at a very sort of, you know, biblicist approach to theological method. Mm. Um, are there any other theological methods that you uh, have an awareness of or don't like and need to put in their place? Yeah, so like across, so if we take, um, I mean, there are all sorts of options here, but if we take like the trajectories of theological method in evangelicalism, there's kind of a movement that starts occurring maybe in the early 90s so that the kind of going trade in the late 20th century in American evangelicalism, at least, is this this type of, um, uh, Lynn Beck calls it cognitive propositionalism. So th th this like kind of type of approach to theological method. And then these people start kind of writing about it in the 90s. Like uh, Richard Lentz has this fabric of theology book where he starts kind of poking at this. And he's like, what if what if theology could be something that's internally coherent mm. uh, and not just this, a bucket of a doctrine here and a bucket of a doctrine here and a bucket of a doctrine here. And that's the point that you were making earlier and thinking about how the doctrines are internally coherent and that that coherence is the gospel. That's what makes them uh, coherent. Uh, Richard Lentz doesn't go quite that far, but he, that's what he, mm. he means in a lot of ways. So after that, we get like Van Hooser's drama of doctrine kind of coming along. Let so it be his name. Doctrine, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. So uh, good old KJV uh, starts doing that, but like the other KJV uh, starts doing this drama of doctrine where there's something about the rehearsal of the gospel and the lived experience of the church that's associated with our reading of the text and our articulation of doctrine. That's very, very helpful for us. I think the publication mark for that's like 2000. Uh, it comes out and kind of has its significant move. So there are people who start doing something that are kind of this like dramaturgy uh, work that, that um, Van Hooser is doing. And then there's a group of people who start doing um, a work that's like a narratival. So the, the, the kind of centerpiece of this interpretation uh, it comes along reading this narrative of scripture. Like I think Michael Horton's doing something that's kind of similar to that. Um, in, in the work that he has. And then eventually in our circles, uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, we start doing dogmatics um, who, that are bringing in uh, this retrieval work more properly. And yeah, there are people who are doing it before, uh, like Thomas Oden is doing it a lot earlier uh, than, than um, Michael Allen or Scott Swain are, but dogmatics, and that's kind of where I live. I live in a dogmatics world. So in the uh, that's, that's a little where... bit of a, a little bit of a resourcement and from the from the past and then doing proper, you know, Protestant dogmatics, um, in a sense. Yeah, like intentionally Trinitarian Christocentric. And there are different types of dogmatics too, like even within that sub kind of field of theology, there's some different methods in play. But um, there's something about being confessional that's required to do this dogmatics work. We're doing it in retrieval. So this conversation with uh, our brothers and sisters who have preceded us in the faith, a theological exegesis is a big piece of this. So reading the text of scripture um, with the expectation that it's the revelation of God, uh, according with an exegesis that expects that we're going to behold Christ as we yeah. read this text. So really intentionally Christological in that. And then the inner coherence. And, and gospel becomes a center for that in such a way that it's really Trinitarian and really Christocentric. 
yep. uh, in order to do really anything. We can't take a step without being Trinitarian Christocentric because the gospel is Trinitarian Christocentric. Okay. Well, that's, that sounds trivial. I mean, that's that's where I think a lot of theologians, I mean, we can talk about all different theological methods. There's like Barthian sure. theological method. Uh, then you've got this thing called analytic theology. I have so many arguments with my colleagues about analytic theology. Well, I mean, a- analytic Which theology. Which is like kind of dogmatic C. Like there's like analytic lives in this like kind of neighbor world yeah, to dogmatic for, theology for me, in a lot of ways. A- analytic theology is what happens with someone with a kind of, you know, a bachelor in maths starts doing theology. Because the atonement becomes like a calculus, you know, the death of Christ is A over C to the power of X divided by Y. Um, and I just don't do that. I don't do, I don't do numbers. My wife, my wife is the numbers lady. I'm the words guy. Okay. She, she's the accountant. Torrance. I'm, I'm the poet. Oh, sorry. I'm the poet here. That's hilarious. Torrance would love what you just said. Like, there's a part of him that like loves this, this way of like, what if we didn't do it? With this kind of abstracted philosophical way of thinking uh but they're do a, a lot of the analytics guys are Thomistic, so they're doing a lot of thomas aquinas work which puts them as kind of like cousins to this dogmatics world yeah. in a lot of ways yeah now i mean I, I can touch on two brief areas before we get into something more um more niche for you um something in the 20th century that has been big is liberation theology okay oh yeah so this this is this is kind of a thing, and you live closer to South America than I do, and liberation theology has traditionally had some roots in South America. Um, if if you had a a um, a undergraduate student doing like a BA in Bible who said to you, you know, Professor Thornton, what is liberation theology? I mean, how would you how would you explain liberation th- theology to them? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a liberation expert, but I mean, both in a South American context, liberation theology has also played a significant role in African American theological development, uh, different types of liberation theology, right? Because it's this like really kind of macro category and there are all sorts of niche. There's also Asian versions hmm. of this liberation theology, but some of it is reading the text of scripture and recognizing um so i'll do it there's an asian track to get there but there's a korean theologian who who walks through some of this and for him it was reading through the gospel of mark and recognizing uh christ's eye for the crowds who were impoverished and in need and then the work that he does then to move them from this impoverished and need to the freedom that he's accomplishing for them but that freedom isn't mere spiritual freedom and liberation theology but it also comes along with these like social movements from slavery to freedom in some way. But, so, but how that plays out will depend largely by kind of which school within liberation mm-hmm. theology we're, we're, we're working in. But uh, one of the most significant, sometimes the gospel is a social move from some type of poverty or slavery yep. into freedom. Sometimes it's more nuanced so that there is a spiritual move than from mm-hmm. Uh, the slavery to sin to the life in Christ, but always plays out with a move from this social move. And so it de- really depends on which liberation theology we're talking about yeah. there, but there's something about this movement socially um, yeah. from from slavery or impoverishment to freedom. Yeah. So it's very much, you know, um, theology from and for the vantage point of the oppressed, either oppressed. Yeah, ec- absolutely. Economically, which which does at one level does have a lot of traction with the new testament i mean you know jesus says the spirit of the lord is upon me to preach good news to poor set the captives free um you know which is which has got a uh, you know very obvious resonances with some of the things um uh you know liberation theologians say and i mean yeah through the prophets the gospels even you know i think parts of paul are kind of conducive to this um the danger is i think is when liberation theology just becomes a, a means of um, economic improvement and becomes purely a yeah. kind of a kind of you know a social practice which is divorced from the realities that the gospel says that we need not just liberation from the external forces of sin but we need the forgiveness of the sin we've internalized ourselves. So yeah. so when, when it comes to, to liberation theology, I've got two quotes I give to students. One was by um, a South American theologian who said. Um, if I help the poor, they call me a saint. If I ask why they're poor, that they, they call me a Marxist. 
And then the, the other good quote I've got is from a couple of Pentecostal theologians, and they said, um, liberation theologians said they wanted to help the poor. The poor said they'd rather be Pentecostal, um, which, is, which is funny because it is kind of true. Um, but uh, I, think, I think there is a liberationist aspect within um, biblical theology uh, in many ways, but, uh, but how you do that in a balanced way that brings together the spiritual and human needs um, w without lessening either, I think is, is a bit of a chance. So deep down, I've, I've got a little, because of my, you know, obviously I'm a, an Australian Marxist of some variety. I, I do have a little <laughs> bit of a soft spot. Um, be, being where I am, where I, I enjoy all the free um, health care and everything like that, I do have a, a, a slight sympathy for that. But uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to make economic liberation the sum and total meaning of salvation. Oh, yeah. And that's the like, oh, maybe not that kind of liberation theology. Uh, but some are more nuanced than others. Like, it, it really depends even from person to person, mm. theologian to theologian, and kind of where, where you're reading people who would claim the label of liberation theology. But what I tell my students is that one of the benefits of liberation theology in our context of the 20th century has been that they ask some of the right questions for us to think mm. about. So I, I wouldn't consider myself a liberation theology. But they were seeing things in the text that some of those things really are in the text. And so asking us to think about, well, okay, so you have this really clear understanding of the spiritual movement from a death and sin or slavery and sin through the waters of baptism into the life of Christ. But there's some things that are like actually physically playing out in the gospels mm -hmm. and in the, in the epistles. And so how do y'all account for that? Well, not some churches in the 20th century did that really, really well. Some theologians had accounted for that, but not all of us. And so and I appreciate them kind of keeping our feet to the fire to make sure that we're recognizing that there's something that's happening mm. in, in the lives of people that's playing out. So they asked a lot of the right questions, though I'm not sure I would give the answer. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't get the answer that they give. Um, but I appreciate the questions that they ask in ways that make us better at what we do. Like we're a better version of who we are for having answered questions that liberation theologians are asking us. Yeah, I think that's probably a very good way of putting it. Um, also, I mean... What about liberal theology? Now, I've I've got a, I have a thesis on liberal theology, and yeah. I'll, I'll I'll tell you what my thesis is: that liberal theology is the theology that happens when human experience becomes primary, and scripture becomes secondary. So they're really simply taking what is their experience at a a, a given cultural time, at a given at a, a historical time, at a hist at a cultural situation and they're simply using scripture as the grammar to speak about that and that and and so it's it's really the real authority is the surrounding culture and in their own mind uh, li liberal theologians don't think that they're attacking scripture or historic i mean they think they're saving christianity by making it more palatable um more digestible to the reigning you know the reigning zeitgeist the raging spirit of the age so that, that's how i would explain um liberal theology it's it's the attempt to sacralize their own experience uh, i mean do you, do you have any thoughts of that sure so like and if we think of so i mean just liberal theology is a macro category so things you're talking about but if we think of like Friedrich Schleiermacher, for example, as the as the father of Protestant liberalism, which many people do, and use him kind of as a paradigm in what you're saying. Well, part of this, this is part of what he's doing. His intentions are to help the church, but he focuses everything on this God consciousness so that this knowledge of God that we have, instead of orienting it objectively outside of ourselves that we participate in, which I think would be the historic way to do this, he moves that to internal to ourselves so that this gauge of revelation is this our own like consciousness of God mm. uh, that's occurring. And then the other telling piece, so, so he does what you're saying, and he becomes kind of the daddy of, of a lot of this in a lot of ways, um, and it becomes internalizing, so it's about me or my community. Uh, and then the other piece is like, well, where in his systematics does he play scripture? Well, we usually have it at the front, but his doctrine of scripture is under the church because it's the expression of the church's this experience as opposed to the revelation of an objective God. And so even in the ordering of his doctrines, then he's sub subordinated the text of scripture to the experience of the church as opposed to the experience of the church then comes out of a gospel that originates from the text. 
And so I think he, he just becomes a paradigm for us to describe what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And, and Slimark is kind of like the granddaddy of liberal yeah. theology. And then it kind of takes on different forms in the 20th century. And uh, I mean, the way I've always explained um, evangelicalism and Bartian theology is that you've got these, you've got kind of like, you know, Bart was trying to move away from liberal theology to something more confessional and orthodox. Evangelicals were trying to move away from fundamentalism into something more um, centrist and orthodox rather than just being cultural, you know, anti-cultural reactionaries. And they're kind of moving towards the center. Uh, I think Bartians and evangelicals are struggling to be the heirs of the Reformation in the post-Enlightenment era. That's the kind of way I've explained it. So um, the relationship between Bart, they're, they're moving towards a center from different angles, but they're kind of re reacting either against liberal theology or against fundamentalism. So that that's that's my thesis, how I think evangelicals and Bartians are kind of Protestant cousins, both both reacting to a, a post-enlightened religious framework. Yeah, I think if, if you take, I think your last piece is a helpful clarifier, that post-enlightenment piece, because sometimes, depending on uh, the evangelicals we're talking about, sometimes the, the strict dividing lines that evangelicals feel from Bart mm are evangelicals who feel the heritage of the enlightenment and assume a particular epistemology that's coming out of the enlightenment. So when they come get, uh, up and have conversations with Bart, well, Bart's not doing that yeah, because Bart's pretty intentionally rejecting that. And so when he starts rejecting the enlightenment epistemology, sometimes evangelicals have felt a little uneasy about him. So Bart becomes a boogeyman um, for some people. But I think one of the things that Bart does, there are a few things that Bart does that's really helpful even as he may, maybe maybe takes a couple wrong turns here and there, he recovers the centrality of ontology and way we do theology proper as it plays out on everything else. So Bart's doing something that's very trinitarian uh, in a time where people weren't really doing it. So part of his rejection to liberal theology is to bring back that it really matters who God is as triune, and then who who the Son is then is incarnate. Uh, even if he doesn't always play that out right, man, I appreciate him being like we should probably think about these things, guys. Um, and like, you know, I have a bit of a soft spot for Bart because of his, his influence on Torrance. So Torrance isn't particularly Bartian, but Bart has in influenced the way he thought in a lot of ways. Um, and then Torrance has been influential for me. So I think Bart's helpful in those ways. Given that you've brought up um, T.F. Torrance, um, uh, first of all, could you explain to us who who is T.F. Torrance and why should seminary students in Australia or America even care? So who is Torrance and why should anyone yeah. care? Yeah, so Torrance is a Scottish theologian living in the, I mean, he lives from 1913 to 2007, and he's writing in the last half of the 20th century. Um, probably, and uh, other people have said this, uh, the most influential um, British theologian of the late 20th century, uh, whether we agree with him or not, he's prolific in the late 20th century. And so when I have these conversations with someone who's from the British Isles, and I bring up that, it, that I did Torrance, I've learned, I didn't know this at first, but I've learned that everyone has an opinion about him because he's that influential in their context um, as an English speaking uh, British theologian. So because he's influential, that's really helpful. But also the work that he's doing is very interesting. So Torrance uh, grew up as an MK, a missionary kid in China. So he grew up in China, the missionary parents. Um, and so has this kind of heart for mission in the background of the work that he's doing while he's doing this really high level theological work in Europe in the late 20th century. Studies under Bart to do his PhD. So Karl Bart is his doctor Vater, um, and learns a lot of that. Bart kind of sees him as his star student in that, that season of his life. But he's invited to teach at Princeton and he turns it down because that's when World War II broke out and he wanted to go serve the church in his context. And that's one of the things I have a lot of respect for, for Torrance, that he turns down some illustrious positions because he cares about the church in Scotland. Uh, and so he becomes a chaplain um, to the troops in, the, in World War II and then returns to do his work in Scotland so that he can serve the church in his context. And so a lot of the work that he's doing is how do I make the Kirk, the, the church in Scotland, better? Uh, how, how can I, how can I improve the way we're doing it? So he like rewrites some liturgies for the Church of Scotland in that time. Um, he's the, the kind of like head of their, uh, polity system or whatever for a while. Um, and 
Yeah, and, and he's doing something that's both Trinitarian and Christocentric and essentially ecclesial. And that's what drew me into Doran. So the reason I, I he became a, a partner in conversation for me was because he was really, really smart. And so I knew that I could learn from him. But he really cared about mission. So he really does have a place for mission in the middle of this Trinitarian Christocentric um, theology. And he's doing something that's essentially ecclesial. Um, so he can't take a step without talking about the, the ministry of the church and the way that he thinks about what theology is. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he, t- he had a remarkable breadth of interest and he would write on science and religion. He did some stuff, uh, like between, um, Protestants and the Greek Orthodox church. Right. Um, you know, he tried to come up with a formula to reconcile the two of them together. Um, he did. You know, to get he, behind the filioque. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, he had his own unique ideas on covenant theology, incarnation, and Trinity. So he he, he, had, he had a very um, a very wide repertoire of things that he was interested in. But and this is the interesting thing. So he's a part of the ecumenical movement in the 1950s, so like the mid 20th century, and writing a lot of the ecclesiology behind some of the ecumenical work that's happening in the 1950s. Uh, in his scientific work, he sees himself as a missionary. So he's like trying to actually be a minister to the natural sciences, which is pretty cool too. Uh, but in the background of all of those kind of disparate things that you kind of named that were like, oh, he does this, he does that, he does that. He's doing one very clear theological thing in all of them and that he's building his conversations in each of them out of the hypostatic union. So no matter where he's going from place to place to place to place to place, topic to topic, to topic, to topic, to topic, it is always focused and centered on that the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's what that makes him even more remarkable. There's this and some of it's because he starts writing a little bit later. So he starts publishing after he's really fully developed um, widely. But every time he deals with different topics, he's doing this one thing and he's remarkably consistent over hundreds of works about that one thing that he does. And that's the exposition of why the hypostatic union is the centerpiece of the Christian faith in every possible direction. Okay. Well, that's, that's certainly worth remembering. That's something that's definitely worth being a, a key motif in, in a lifetime of theological work. Well, as totally. we, as we finish off Christy, um, if somebody asked you, if a student said to you, what's the number one thing I should remember about theological method? what would be the number one thing that you would say? What, what would you say? If someone said, look, what's the, num- what's the main thing I need to take away when all this talk about theological method? Is it, is it A, uh, you know, I should use Thomas Torrance as my template. B, just do what Michael Bird does. Um, C, get a lifetime subscription to the works of Kevin Van Hootser. Uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's, what's, your, what's your advice for up and coming young theologians when it comes to theological method? The number one bit of your own wisdom you want to impart to them. Yeah, I mean, I think, think really well about what you're doing before you do it. Because w- when you assume a method without being really clear about what this object is, what it is that you're trying to know, you end up doing weird things. So let the object, who you're trying to know, who God is, designate for you the method through which you know it and make sure that matches because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So our method of knowledge for him has to be proper to who he is. Okay, well, that is probably a a good way to end off. So thank you for your time, Uh, Dr. Thornton. uh, We wish great blessings upon you. Wherever you go, may your land be filled with kangaroos and Vegemite, uh, which would be so much Could it be? May it be. Well, thank you very much for joining me, uh, Christy. It's been a pleasure talking to you about Theological Method. Thank you, Mike.